Today, we present on how to run a value chain analysis in 2018, keeping in mind the impact of digital economy on business models. Our presenters today will be Anusha Pandey and myself, Abhisha Sood. Um, so today, we will take you through, as we all know, digital economy is not a new concept, but what does digital economy do to business models of companies and how is it relevant and how should it be measured from a tax and transfer pricing point of view is the key focus of today's webinar. Today, we will try to understand at first what do value chains of digital economy impacted business models include? Because unless you understand the value chain of how a digital business model operates, it is impossible to determine tax or transfer pricing classification of all parts that go into generation of value for such a business. So we'll start with explaining what are the different types of considerations involved in assessing value chains of digital economy business models. As a next step, we will try to identify or tell you talk about the steps to identify how to classify the intangibles generated by digital economy. Do all of them get a routine return, non-routine return, or potentially even a service-based return? And last but not the least, we'll discuss how to do controversy management when you're dealing with business models of this type. With this, we start with the characteristics of these kind of business models, and I invite Anusha to begin with this presentation. So as a result of our digital economy, we, have, we can see that there are four digital business models on this present slide. Reseller, vertically integrated firms, input suppliers, value shop, multi-sided platforms, which is value network. So in the first two that you see, reseller and vertically integrated firms, Value chain is the form that you can use to, to see where the value li lies in these particular business models. For the next one, that is input suppliers business model. Value shop is the most appropriate way to see where the value lies and how to describe this kind of business model. And the fourth one, which is multi-sided platforms. Again, it's a value network, which best describes the business model and not a value chain. So what exactly is a multi-sided platform? So to understand what is a multi-sided platform, I can give you one, a couple of examples. For example, Uber, Airbnb, blah, blah, car. So what, what is common to all these companies? What do they do? What they basically do is they uh, connect transactions between end users, basically, they, and they act as facilitators to link the supplier with the customers. And in for uh, multi-sided platforms, all the control and liability will lie uh, with the supplier and not the company which is running this platform. So this will be the multi-sided platform model. For the input supplier model, what these companies do is they, uh, they connect one company, uh, suppose they acquire a software and they will provide it to another company. This is an input supplier model, and an example of this is, for example, Microsoft. They do not have the software themselves, but they can they provide it to another company, which will provide it to their end customer. They do not directly provide it to the customer here. This is linking B2B. This is the business to business model. Then what is the vertically integrated form? In a vertically integrated form, they have already acquired the supplier side of the business and have integrated in their current uh, business format. For example, Amazon Workplace here and Netflix. Netflix from the production side and not from the streaming side. So what Netflix also does now is it produces content. And similarly with Amazon e-commerce, what it does is it has acquired warehouses and logistics as a to provide services. Now lastly, what is the reseller model? In the reseller business model, they buy products from the supplier and they sell it onwards to the end customer. But here, all the control and liability will lie with the reseller itself. But what another thing that we have to see here is, for example, in vertically integrated firms, they can also be a reseller. So we have to see each segment of the business separately to see what kind of a business model it is. For example, in Amazon, 
Amazon also has Amazon e-commerce, which is a business platform, which is a reseller. You can buy, customers can log in and buy products. Another is Amazon e-commerce, where you, they provide warehousing and logistic services. Another is Amazon web space, where uh, they provide software to Airbnb and uh, Spotify, for example, to provide cloud uh, services. And uh, as we can see on the extreme left, what we already discussed, the price control, liability, user affiliation, intermediary, these are some of the key characteristics that are present in, for business models. And I'll give you one example for price control and liability here. For example, in the cases of Uber, it is dependent on the number of users that are there at a particular time, point in time that a price is determined. But for example, for control and liability, in the example of Airbnb, the control and liability will always, for maintaining the accommodation, will lie with the, uh, with the supplier and will not lie with the Airbnb. So if you see here in price control and liability, it is with the end, the control, it lies with the end user and not with the firm, which is in the case of vertically integrated firms as they will be determining the prices and will also have control and liability. So Anusha, would it be fair to say that these resellers and vertically integrated firms that we describe here, they used to exist before as well, like there were reseller models, companies that would buy something from one and sell to the other, and other companies that would do everything from start to finish themselves. They used to exist earlier, but digital economy is bringing in some efficiencies within their functioning so that one or two steps out of the chain are either automated or removed. Whereas the uh, two models on the right hand side, the input supplier and the, the multi-sided business platforms are newcomers in the market that have sort of come in because of digital economy. Yes, this is as a consequence of digital economy and in, for example, what you were mentioning, reseller and vertically integrated firms, even though they were existing in the traditional model itself, but what has happened here is, is reliance on software, which has really increased and which has convert, which has made the shift from traditional business model cycle to a digital one. Right. Whereas multi-sided platforms heavily rely on uh, business platforms, software, etc. So this is completely a new phenomenon. Right. So today we will try to understand to what extent the value chain concept developed by Michael Porter can remain applicable to this type of these four types of business models and what improvements are needed to it to understand the business models of some of the types of companies we see today. So just to carry that point forward, the Porter style value chain was based on a principle that how does a company convert its inputs into outputs could be measured by these five characteristics, five primary activities, such like inbound logistics, operations, outbound logistics, marketing and sales, and service and after sales support. So these were identified to be common to the value chain of all companies trying to deliver a product. Well, now in the digital economy, as we were seeing on the previous slide, a lot of companies are not just converting inputs into outputs, but are just connecting a service recipient with a service provider. So in that model, in, for such companies, this inbound logistics, outbound logistics model does not apply so much. So therefore, in the next two slides, we will show how to do a value chain analysis for multi-sided platforms or for input suppliers, which are only trying to resolve a problem and trying to provide a service to a business mainly. But this type of value chain developed by Michael Porter does remain applicable to the case of resellers as well as vertically integrated firms. Now, when, as Anusha was saying just earlier, when we talk about a reseller model or a vertically integrated model, one company might have 
both of these attributes and at the same time some of the multi-sided platform attributes as well so it's not fair to do a value chain analysis first of all for the whole company distinct business lines i should be carved out based on the fact that how does a company earn money does the company take on the risk of the product and service then it is more in the category of reseller and vertically integrated firm to which such a value chain may be applicable but if the company just connects the service recipient to provider and does not take any ownership of the quality of service or the risks associated with provision of the service then it falls in more of an intermediary network provider or the multi sided network provider category so with these uh, considerations we move on to what concepts are used to explain the value creating concepts of input suppliers and multi sided business models okay to start with um, what to start with input suppliers now as anusha explained input suppliers are entities that have an approach that earn money by resolving problems providing solutions that is the profile of an input supplier so now who can be an input supplier let's take for an ex uh, for a minute an example a consulting firm providing identifying the a problem to which its customers need solution coming up with a solution and ways to implement that solution would be a typical example of an input supplier another uh, typical example of an input supplier is so we have known that there are companies such as spotify and airbnb collect a lot of data now if they collect a lot of data they need a lot of storage space to store that data for this purpose they use services provided by amazon web service which in this context so amazon as we all know is a reseller but amazon web service in this context providing a cloud computing or storage space to airbnb and spotify type companies is acting like an input supplier so this is what we also meant earlier by identifying different streams of businesses so this service classifies as an um, can be classified as an input supplier and in order to determine what are the how such a business generates money for itself it is essential to start with what is the problem that a business is trying to resolve some of the input suppliers may be focused on resolving only one kind of problem whereas other input suppliers may be resolving multiple problems at the same time for instance um a consultancy firm may be providing consultancy only on one particular aspect so it would be an input supplier for just that particular service whereas if we take a company like microsoft in addition to providing some consultancies it provides solutions that can be used by other businesses which then use those services to deliver value to their clients so what are there are five things that are common in how input suppliers generate value for themselves all of them start with identifying a problem to which they can then find a solution finding a solution would result in various options on how to resolve that problem the next step would then be how do these firms execute that solution and final and last but not the least would be how do they control and evaluate how they have done in the past because that would again determine what problems they acquire and what problems they resolve so these instead of looking at a typical inbound uh, outbound logistics kind of model to identify how, which are the value creating activities for an input supplier it is we are we you should follow these five concepts problem acquisition solving presentation of choices execution and control and evaluation this clearly deviates a little bit from the porter style of doing value chain analysis but this is more catered to 
identifying or serving the needs of a business that is just meant to provide a service to resolve a problem. Moving on to the next um, type of value chain evaluation. Yeah, as we had seen in the previous slides, that for multi-sided platforms, we cannot use normal value chain that is Porter style value chain, which has inbound logistics, outbound lo logistics to represent this value network, uh, value network chain. For example, if you look at the present slide, you can see that certain activities have been identified as primary activities, that is network promotion and contract management, service provisioning, and infrastructure operation. So in order to represent a value chain for these value networks, these particular factors have to be identified and what value, what element of value is created has to be seen for each of these categories separately. For example, what is the worth? What is the value which is being com contributed by network promotion and contract management? Now to understand this, we first have to see what exactly is network promotion and contract management. So what do the so how these entities undertake promotional campaigns, advertising campaigns, they make use of cookies on website to promote Airbnb, LinkedIn, etc. This is one of the ways that value networks are promoted. Another way value networks are promoted is by making use of other value network based platforms, for example, social ne network. Lot of uh, link, uh, Airbnb links, etc. are available for Facebook users who regularly use Airbnb, so you will be co constantly updated on the new accommodations which are available, new price ranges which are available. Then there is contract management. That this whole concept of value network is actually reliant on entering into a contract with a customer, and it can also be terminated. When the contract is terminated, you you lose the customer. For example, with Uber, based on your customer Uber rating, if it is really below a certain threshold. Uber can go ahead and terminate your contract. So this is the first prime activity that you have to see. Second is service provisioning. Like for example, what kind of service is your platform going to actually provide? For example, in the case of Airbnb, it is providing accommodation. For example, in Uber, you're receiving a car with a driver and, and so on. Then the third is infrastructure operation, which is the most important thing because this is the backbone of your business, which is your platform, which is heavily reliant on your software, logarithms, etc., to collect customer data, to collect big data, uh, to see what are the market trends, and to use it in your business to further sell, uh, for example, more accommodation via Airbnb and Uber, which re relies on this platform to actually match the driver with the customer. So this is an example of a value network. However, one thing we actually see which remains consistent is support activities and primary activities. For all value network, value chain, value shop, we still have to always identify what are your primary activities and what are your support activities. So this remains a consistent element. And technology development, Anusha, here is uh, described as uh, a supportive activity. So are we here referring to, because in the bottom and primary activities, we talk about infrastructure operation, which I also imagine is related to technology. So how would you differentiate for a company that is a multi-sided business model, this infrastructure operation, which is also technology, and this technology development, which is a supportive activity? Right. So what an organization has to keep in mind is that there's certain routine intangibles and certain unique intangibles which are contributing some value to the business. What you have to see is what is the amount of value which is being contributed. For example, unique intangible is the basis for your infrastructure operation, whereas your routine intangible, which you can give a normal cost plus return for, can be part of technology development. Yeah, probably the platform that you develop at the beginning is the most crucial and thereafter maintenance of it would be a supportive activity but compensation for both would need to be determined separately is right. that what you say so what we'll have to see here is look at the dempy functions right and see what is contributing the maximum value for example for uber development of this app 
is the main thing and the platform which backs this app is the main contributor to their business they do not have phone service like you can you cannot call the driver you cannot contact uber everything operates through the app even if you have to complain about the services you use this particular app so development of this app would have contributed the maximum value to the service which would and maintenance of it would would be infrastructure operations for in, in this case and if uber app goes I down see. for example then the services also stop so everything for uber is dependent on this particular app so for them i would not necessarily say that maintenance here would go as a support and not as the main, main contributor part. So here, technology development. If we are talking specifically about Uber or the type of company, right. would possibly be general IT services right. that we currently see, right. like traditional business IT as support. Well. So yeah, it is. I agree. Interesting and also difficult to try and identify not just what are routine and non-routine intangibles, but how they differ across different industries as well. Uh, moving on to what are some of the common characteristics of digital economy business models? Yes, so from value shop, value network, all the slides that we have seen previously, we can see there is one major trend here, which is enhanced user participation. What digital economy essentially relies on is the number of subscribers a particular business will have. So it's heavily reliant on that. Second is collection of big data. So what do these entities basically do? They look at all the data which they can gather through cookies, through Facebook, through social media, and to see what what is the customer actually interested in today. So, collection of big data, analysis of data, is what is one of the key characteristics. Then another is reduction in investments. So, what has happened with increasing user participation that in that, that companies want to take a shift from investing heavily in the infrastructure to investing more on return on data. What, what I'm trying to explain, you will see more in the subsequent slide for this point. And the last point I'll just touch upon briefly here is generation of unique intangibles. So as discussed previously, for Uber, the app and the platform which backs the app would be the unique intangible for them. So what digital economy has also brought up is generation of unique intangibles, valuation of which should be a major concern for all such companies in future. So as I was discussing previously, return on investment is on a decline and return on data is on an increase in digital economy. So what have we have tried to show through this particular slide is, for in the first block, you will see the traditional telecom players, that is AT&T, Verizon, Liberty Global, T-Mobile, for example. In the second, you will see the traditional players in the media and content industry, Disney, which is the largest, followed by Comcast and Time Warner. And then what is data factory? In the third, you will see data factory. So data factory is a very asset light industry, which relies heavily on distribution. So distribution is the key business of a data factory. If you see Netflix, YouTube, Hulu, or some of Amazon Prime are some of the examples listed here. So now again, some of you might have this confusion that I, initially I was talking that Netflix is a vertically integrated form. And here I've listed it as a data factory as merely a distribution platform. So what we have to keep in mind here is this is not the production co of content side of business for Netflix. This is just the distribution side of business of Netflix, which has been, uh, which is considered to be a data factory. So to understand data factory, you can just see it synonymous as a distribution channel for distribution of online content. So can we say as um, investments go down in businesses, that would mean margins in businesses would reduce as well. So if the in order for telecom and media companies earlier to make business, they would make 15 to 20% margin, a lot of it would also come from, say, distribution channels. And if companies such as Netflix are taking over those distribution channels, then there, there would be reduction in the margins that these telecom and media companies can make, right? Right. So is that one of the is that one of the reasons because of digital economy and how would you say companies in the future should deal with it? Right. So what essentially 
we are trying to show through these slides and what Avisha's question is as well. If you see the telecom players, what is the telecom industry basically? It is heavily reliant on infrastructure. It needs your telecom towers, antenna which is installed under towers, constructing this whole uh, renting of such a tower to place your antenna. It's a very investment centric business. And same with media, like generation of content, making of movies, like getting new ideas every day. It's a very investment centric business. But now both AT&T and Time Warner saw how profitable Netflix was when it had just launched as, as a streaming platform and Netflix had not actually started its production, its own in-house production of content. So what these two industries started to do was they have tried to do enter into certain mergers. For example, AT&T and Time Warner have of late had a merger in which uh, AT&T wants to enter the distribution channel and generate content for mobiles, for example. They want to generate small videos that users can use while on the way to travel, for example, something like YouTube. Then another such example is Verizon that has uh, done a merger with Yahoo of late where Verizon wants to make use of all the advertisement content that they can access, they can have access to because they want to see what the customer is actually interested in and expand their business in that fashion. Because this is really important in digital economy because analysis of customer data, customer trends will help you have new business lines, for example. So who knows for Verizon in future, we see them introducing new business lines on the basis of the data that they have analyzed. And another thing trend we notice here is that a lot of media houses amongst themselves want to enter into mergers as well. For example, you must have heard of the very famous Disney and 21st century Fox merger. But, uh, and uh, through this merger, what Disney wants to do is they want to have their own streaming platform, for example, such as Netflix, but only Disney and 21st century Fox movies, which is the larger chunk of uh, Hollywood will be broadcast on it. So of, if you see at present, maybe uh, in Netherlands is still available, but in US, Disney has withdrawn all its Disney movies from Netflix because they want to provide it uh, on their own streaming platform. So, so it's leading to some mergers while it's leading also to some firms becoming, trying to acquire all uh, channels of distribution. Right. Right. So, because uh, what these companies notice is that ret by, what by return on data we mean is by number the number of hits that a particular website would get. For example, more number of hits you have, more number of subscribers, more number of users, higher is your revenue, which is a quicker turnaround than the on return on investment, the revenue that you generate on return on investment. Yeah, if we take for example Spotify that uh, recently went public with the uh, with its listing in the last month, uh, is a company that is built more on very little investment except apart from the initial investment on the platform that they have developed. And after the platform has been developed, the popularity of it is the key determinant factor of its value. The more number of users it has the more amount of data it generates. So the value of companies is not measured as much on the investment they make, but how good they are at collecting and analyzing data. Right. right. So with this, if we move on to try and analyze um, some types based on the examples we presented on what are the key characteristics you should keep in mind while trying to do a value chain analysis for digital businesses. In this section, we present two examples and explain how value chains for them look like. So once again, we are back to famous Amazon, which is a vertically integrated form and is also a reseller at the same time. So for their model, mostly all of you might already be aware, but I will just repeat it once more. Uh, there's a headquarter entity, which is supposed in a particular country. There's a subsidiary, which might be in the same country as the headquarter, but also might be in another jurisdiction. And there is, of course, the final customer consumer, which might be in the country of the subsidiary or is in another country altogether. And then you have cloud computing, which is hosting of server support and logistics provider. So what happens in this particular business model? It is the final customer logs in on the website in the local language perhaps 
which is uh, provided by the local subsidiary to it the customer provides his uh, login details like logs in selects the product that it wants to buy makes use of the platform purchases the product the subsidiary in turn contacts the logistics provider in the country of the customer or perhaps in another country which is going to provide the quickest uh, delivery to the customer and uh, provides and the logistics provider in turn provides the final product to the customer then the third thing is another thing is cloud computing so to uh, support such a heavily plat reliant uh, business platform uh, and website run business e-commerce business what is required is uh, cloud computing support and uh, amazon can rely on the third party service provider or can actually rely on uh, amazon web space itself which airbnb and spotify are also using to, for uh, hosting servers perhaps and uh, right. another example is for example for uh, logistics provider amazon can also actually make use of their own amazon uh, e-commerce warehousing and logistics service instead of contacting a third party provider to provide the goods to the customer so in case it's we use uh, we see amazon as a fully vertically integrated firm it will lead to a lot of supply chain efficiencies because from cloud computing logistics service provider warehousing transport everything is run by amazon but it doesn't do so for all of its products at itself is that what you're trying to say or why should uh, it make a difference whether amazon uses its own channels to distribute or do logistics or a third party to do so so for example it really depends in the country of a sub local subsidiary uh, amazon does not have a local uh, warehouse then they have to have a third party provider as a backup to provide it to the customer what about margins that amazon makes on different products like amazon has different subscriptions for people uh if for example you have um amazon prime subscription or amazon uh, fulfilled by amazon subscription oh. then you can get one day delivery so would it be possible that to ensure that because on those uh, subscriptions amazon earns money as well so if it is not able yeah. to uh, liaise with third party service providers it could possibly keep stock in its own warehouses to fulfill those delivery orders on which it that just leads to amazon earning a little bit premium commission yeah perhaps it does do that because it cannot dictate the delivery terms to a third party service provider and when everything is in house they have total control of it full control of it they can uh, actually provide conclusive delivery terms to the customer such as providing one or two days delivery which might seem unreasonable to a third party logistics service provider another point that we have to see here is every every time the customer logs in on the local website and wants to purchase and browses through the website to see whatever products they want to purchase it's the headquarters that directly gets the customer data so that amazon gets to see what are the latest customer trends which is one thing we've seen as common in uh, digital economy business models that is reliance on big data so as uh, avish had previously discussed this porter's value chain can be used to represent reseller and vertically integrated business models so we can still make use of inbound logistics operations outbound logistics to determine the value chain of reseller slash vertically integrated models for example for amazon in this particular case for inbound logistics we can show that they so source uh, suppliers globally and for ip we can have a software to monitor supply chain for example in the traditional business model they did not have local uh, global suppliers they had local suppliers and probably this ip element was also missing for example for uh, in the operations category they have uh, inventory data in real time in the digital economy whereas in the case of traditional reseller model inventory data did not take place in real time this is a key difference and should be highlighted in the value chain 
Another aspect is the heavy reliance on the website and the logarithms used to target the customers. Third element is outbound logistics, which is now all orders are uh, placed via internet, which wasn't the case in the traditional reseller model. And last, uh, one more point is sales and marketing, that uh, marketing can actually take place via use of cookies. Right, so in these kind of Amazon or any other reseller or vertically integrated models, at the end of the day, they are delivering a product to an end customer. And in order to do that, they are mainly just using up software to bring some efficiencies at every point in the value chain. Right. So here we are coming back with that data or other forms of intangibles that are bringing in these efficiencies. How important are they? Are they could these are tasks that were earlier done by people and are now being automated? Do you think that requires because you use software instead of people? Does that suddenly require a royalty type compensation? Yes. So I coming back to our earlier discussion on uh, what is technology development, network infrastructure, etc. So what has to be seen here again is what is the value that has been contributed by use of this particular software or a logarithm. For example, again, in case of Amazon, development of website algorithm is key a to unique, their business. yes, it's key to their business. You can say it's a unique intangible, which would actually require proper valuation and not just a simple royalty return. But for example, normal uh, softwares, which uh, redirect you to a website for payment, for example, uh, redirected to where you get the PayPal link or you get the link for your credit card payments, etc. That is just a provision of a payment gateway, for example. And that, that can be, be a routine. Routine and tangible yeah. or bordering a service return potentially. Yes, perhaps a service as well. You'll have to analyze it. So these are the complexities that come with digital business models. And then to complicate it a little bit further, if we talk about in the previous example, at least there was a product or a service that was being provided and someone somewhere was generating that service and a firm was either acquiring it or producing it and delivering then to its end customer. But what we see in case of business multi-sided business mo models, the most common and widely known mo example of it is Uber. That's why we try to explain this concept there. And what does Uber do? It has a headquarter in one country, various subsidiaries in different countries that enter into contracts with passengers on one side and drivers on the other. And as passengers make payments, part of it remains with the subsidiary and the remaining is made, the remaining is paid to the driver. So be it Uber or any other multi-sided platform where you can log you as a user can log on to the platform and look for a service provider. Other common examples are Airbnb, or if you need, for example, cleaning help, you can just log on to a couple of websites that connect you with a service provider in your region willing to provide that service to you, rather than you having to go through an agency and provide them a commission. So it is, there's an independent service provider that by connecting through a network is able to provide its services to a broad range of users and in the same way a user in need of a service through this platform is able to connect to a broad range of service providers but it is the platform the network the application that is really key in this business going forward so for these kind of businesses that do not take ownership of the service or product they are providing. The, uh, on the selling side or the service providing side of multi-sided business platforms can be either a service provider, as I said, or a product developer. But these multi-sided business models are only bringing users in touch with someone who is providing the service or product they need. The, the businesses, the bus multi-sided businesses, do not ever take ownership of the product or service or the risks associated with such provision. 
For example, Uber. If the, the driver does not provide you a good service, you as a user can give them a bad rating. Uber does not take liability for that service. Another example of these multi-sided platform would be a market, excuse me, a marketplace where you as a user directly transact with someone selling a product or a service. Now, if that product or service turns out to be faulty, all the my network is going to do is put you in touch with that service provider or ban that service provider from providing services to future user or make that service provider pay in some other manner. But ultimately, the network does not take ownership or risks and therefore does not want to claim a compensation from the end user for taking these ownerships or risks. So for such a company, the value chain analysis should comprise of four components. Network promotion. What does network promotion mean? If you have such a network, the success of it is dependent on how as many users you have on the front and the back end. So promotion of network and maintaining a global base is essential. Next, contract management. This goes hand in hand with network promotion. If you have uh, a network, if you have the people, you want to cement that relationship in the form of uh, you want to store their data, have a binding contract with the users at both ends that in case some sanctions are imposed, they are binding upon both sides of the users. Next is service provisioning. All of these networks are providing one or the other service. Uber provides you a way to get from place A to place B. Airbnb provides you a place to stay where you, when you go to some place and so on and on. And network infrastructure, which we were alluding on a little bit earlier as well, is one of the key components again, because development of this network infrastructure, which is the application or the platform itself, is common as well as crucial to all of multi-sided business platforms. And therefore, all of these key characteristics should be taken into account in doing a value chain analysis for these kind of networks. With this, we move on to a few areas where we see a link between value chain analysis, digital economy, and tax and transfer pricing point of view. From this point onwards, we also open the floor for any questions. If you have, please type them in the chat box and we will soon address them. So moving on to how does this information about digital economy help us in our tax TP dealings? So the three things that we have to see here is how do you present value chain in TP documentation? That is, how do you present value chain of a digital economy business model in your master file, which is now a requirement under OECD guidelines. Then second is, how do you classify the intangible, whether it's a routine intangible and should get a normal cost plus return, or is it a unique intangible which requires valuation, or you have to look at it from the investment center profile and do a residual profit split, for example. And then lastly, how to undertake controversy management. For example, which are the tools that should be available to you or that you should utilize uh, to resolve controversy or keep it to the minimum. Okay, so as Anusha was saying, where can we help is first and foremost, how to present a value chain analysis in TP documentation. As you all know, in the master file, you need to present what does the value chain of your business model looks like and we truly understand what digital business models look like. We've been working on the side to develop some infographics that explain what are the changing value chains of some traditional industries. Just very quickly, if we look at the insurance industry, the traditional models were that customers would go and talk to the insurance brokers to try and understand what kind of insurance facilities are available, which are more suited to them. So it was, and they, these businesses would try to get customers to buy into one or the other product. So it was more like a pull model that this industry was following to attract customers. But as of now, with the emergence of big data, 
insurance companies storing year over year data of customers keeping a track of their preferences and analyzing this data they are able to customize products suited to the needs of these customers so instead of customers coming to them and asking about which facilities may be suited for them this analysis has enabled insurance companies to already push specified customized products onto the customers so this is one of the key differences that has overturned the value chain of an insurance company if you were if you are an insurance company working in today's day and age it would be it would be only essential that you take this element of data and information into account while presenting a value chain in your master file another such example is uh, the merger of retail and wholesale industry for quite a few goods here what we want to talk about is let's take example of alibaba which started off as primarily only a website where wholesaler for wholesalers to buy stuff from but as of now it has become possible to buy smaller amounts for, for purposes of retail via alibaba as well so what does this do to the business of the manufacturers who are selling these products earlier manufacturers would pay a margin to wholesalers then a margin to retailer and then the product would reach the customer now if the channel for wholesale and retail has merged the margins that can be made have also to be merged and therefore reduced because you're not going to pay the same person the same margin twice just because it's doing both wholesale and retail so this leads to from a customer's point of view lowering the price of the product or service so from a customer's point of view whichever company can deliver products to it of high quality and cheaper price will be the most desired one to go to so in determining a value chain analysis for a manufacturing and selling company it is essential to identify whether different whether the retail and wholesale sectors have merged what do that do to the value chain, to the overall margins and what does that do to presentation of value chains in the master file another common example uh, another common example to be seen is in the case of a uh, fashion retailer if we take brands like uh, or companies like uh, asos zalando etc which make uh, money by totally through totally a digital value chain that is <coughs> excuse me that is they i know they make their money the most by making sure they are the first ones to get a particular design in their on their website and how they do this is if people let's say post pictures on instagram they are first to have a look at it and try to build that design into through their manufacturers and uh, bring it in a sellable form as soon as possible now companies like asos and zalando don't even have stores so they don't even have to waste the time it takes for the manufacturer to manufacture something and bring it to the retail store for them so long soon after the manufacturer prepares something a photograph of it is taken and placed on the website customers can already buy it and it will be delivered sometimes directly from the manufacturer's location to the end customer so the a typical concept of strategy and design which used to be key to value chains of fashion retailers has become less and less important and this data analysis through instagram facebook or other ways of user interaction and converting them as quickly as possible into outputs is what is the term is the key value driving factor and all of these things are important for you to focus on because this is what determines which entity in your group gets to make how much margin another area of um, another area of tax transfer pricing importance that has become important is this one how to classify uh, classify an intangible so as we saw in the previous slide in the new uh, retailer business model inspired by digital economy or having all the elements of a digital economy 
data analysis is highly relevant and for data analysis what is most important is existence of certain algorithms or certain uh, software which helps an, a company to analyze the customer trends in the market and uh, in, and go fast track their production basically so here we see certain platforms like a normal business platform that is for amazon its website data analysis software to study the market trends uh, which can which uh, boohoo esos etc make use of then uh, data storage storage of all the customer data payment gateway for example links to um, uh, to credit cards or paypal for example to do your purchase and business support services that is uh, customer services the, uh, you have a problem with the product you call the helpline or you uh, provide the complaint in an email format etc so what are the functionalities of these platforms have to be considered in order to either classify them as a routine non routine intangible or as a service so is there an element of artificial intelligence to it if yes there is a possibility there's a high likelihood that this would can fall under chapter 6 of oecd tp guidelines that is as a unique intangible or is the provision of artificial intelligence so common to this particular type of an industry that is it a provision of a service that is chapter 7 this is highly relevant because you will escape from presenting this information in the master file under the dempy functions category and will provide it in under intra group services and emphasis will not be on writing how the intangible has been developed enhanced or maintained for example same applies for data origination is it actually a chapter 6 or chapter 7 intangible or chapter 6 intangible or chapter 7 service but we cannot leave this concept at that even in chapter 6 there are certain distinctions available even though the oecd definition of an intangible is rather strict in comparison to the classification of intangibles in local laws of certain countries intangibles have still be classified as routine or non routine intangible so if origination of data was so regular to this particular business that it was you had to give it a cost plus return and it was not contributing any value to the business then it would be a routine intangible or whether it be a non routine intangible for which you would have to do a valuation or a profit split this has to be seen and uh, is highly essential in today's world of digital economy so what the reliance on software is so heavy in these industries that it has to be, that each functionality each element of this particular software has to be analyzed in great detail separately to see whether it's an intangible or to give it a normal cost plus return for a service or a routine intangible that's another area where tpa can help and uh, moving uh, to the last topic about controversy management like how would you do controversy management in general and what do you, can you do for digital businesses well uh, an advanced pricing agreement and apa is very commonly thought to be providing certainty to a company on the margins one or more of its group entities can make so what would companies typically do when they get into an apa they would go to talk to one or both tax authorities in which uh, uh sorry they would go to talk to one or both the tax authorities in whose countries there are entities of the company entering into a transaction with each other now if they come to an agreement they would say okay for instance country a pays country b a cost plus 5% and this is an agreement entered into by the company as well as the governments of these countries to for the next 3 years or 5 years let's say however what happens if in the next 5 years the, due to the due to digital economy advent the overall margins to be made in the value chain of the company reduced by far 
so far that it's no longer feasible for the company to provide a cost plus 5% margin to one of its group entities. So in such a case, is, if, is an advanced pricing agreement really preventing you from controversy or rather leading you to it? If we look at the slide in front of us, this presents a typical example of banks which used to make commission on every transaction that used to go through them because earlier businesses selling something to a customer would send an invoice to a customer. The customer would then use its own bank account to pay the invoice and on that bank to bank transaction, the banks would charge a commission. But right now, with a lot of uh, companies such as Alipay, WeChat Pay, and a few other payment gateways that have not only started acting as payment gateways, but also taking on a part of the value chain that belonged traditionally to banks, is reducing the commissions banks can make. Now, if such banks have entered into some advanced pricing agreements with one or more of their group entities, what would they do if the overall margin in their value chain has gone down from 20 to 15 percent in a course of five years? Can they still uphold that APS? Or do they need to enter into another set of negotiations? So therefore, these are questions to be considered at a point in time before you make your controversy plan. The next slide illustrates the same principle, but just for a different industry. And with this, we would like to also inform all attendees that this uh, issue of controversy management is not common just to digital economy, but to industries, but to companies at large after BEPS. For this purpose, two weeks from now on 21st of June 2018, TPA Global is conducting a workshop on global tax controversy and we more than co uh, cordially invite you to that workshop. Hope uh, if you would like more information on our controversy event, please follow this link. And if you would like any more information on digital economy, value chain analysis, or classification of intangibles, please feel free to contact us through the information on the slides. The recording of the presentation as well as the slides will be made available shortly and an email will be sent to all of you. With that, we thank you all for joining our presentation and we hope to see you at the next one. Thank you.